Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Tom and you're watching youtube.com slash get nuanced. And apologies in advance if you were expecting me to be recording inside. I'm actually on the balcony. You're often seeing it in my other videos as I'm inside, but today I decided to do a little bit of a change of pace and record out here because the weather is pretty all right. It's the morning, the sun just rose, and I figured I would just test the audio and see how it would do in contrast with all my other videos. But I'm again recording on the phone I have which is a relatively old phone, I think it's the iPhone SE, in contrast to occasionally using the uh, Razer Kia with the Yeti. Uh, let me know how the quality is, and I'll gauge based off of your feedback what I should be doing going forward. I try to experiment and see from time to time as I've just started really producing videos on a routine basis what works best, but I digress. In this video today, I'd like to talk about an interesting topic that, or the topic that I at least find very interesting, that I don't think a lot of people have been paying as much attention to in lieu of the global pandemic. And that is the Syrian crisis or the Syrian conflict, which has been called by many US and Western observers the Syrian civil war. But honestly, that label is relatively questionable considering that once you understand what's really going on on the ground, you start to realize that that label can be more or less disputed depending on what perspective you're looking at things from and whose narrative you'd like to believe and what narrative yourself that you perceive as, you know? Because everything at the end of the day is a product of differing perspectives and it is the culmination of various perspectives that I've used myself personally to analyze the events on the ground. And I try to look at sources both from the West and also from Syria inside the country and also, you know, Eastern observers as well. And I try to keep in mind that all of these different uh, factions have their own biases and keeping in mind that I want to try to see if I can come up myself with the best possible picture, which a lot of times, as you probably heard as a cliche, the truth is often somewhere in the middle between the two conflicting sides of any given story. There's always two sides to every story, but in between is usually where the truth lies. And I find that this article in particular that I was reading from Al Jazeera, which is you know, uh, made by the, Al Jazeera is the station owned by the government in Qatar. It's, uh, obviously going to have some biases but given that i think the topic in and out itself i mean i've checked other sources as well and it seems like it's legitimate but you can see for yourself it'll be included below but in this video i wanted to give my thoughts on it and that is the seemingly growing rift between the russian president vladimir putin and his uh ally which is the current ruler of syria uh, Bashar al-Assad, who is the president of Syria, who many in the West consider a dictator. He has been ruling Syria ever since 2000, when his father Hafez al-Assad, whom I think in 1963, ever since then, had been ruling Syria after a military coup. And he is basically from a faction, a minority in Syria known as the Alawites, which are a uh, religious minority, which a lot of mainstream Sunni uh, Muslims don't even really consider it Islamic and is more in line with the Shia version of Islam. And as such, obviously, Iran has been backing Assad along with Russia and has been getting their proxies such as Hezbollah and other Shia militias to help him as since 2011 with the original Arab Spring, there has been a war going on in Syria and as of 2020, that conflict is still going on. However, in between, there has been a lot of developments, which I'm sure if you were like me and have been keeping up with them, Things have changed so much in the last nine years, and I'm just gonna give you a brief summary right now, but there's no way that I'm gonna be able to do this topic enough justice on my own. So in the description, I'll have more resources, and I definitely recommend and encourage you guys to not just take my word for everything and check for yourself, because it's a very complicated situation. But I digress. So in 2011, the war started. Uh, there were protesters, I think largely due to the 2006 and 2007, there were droughts and there were shortages in water. And how it basically is, ever since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire uh, in the 1920s after World War I, this region of the Middle East, originally Syria in particular, had belonged to the Ottoman Empire along with modern day Jordan, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And or after World War I, the French had carved out their claims and created the French Mandate of Syria. And then following a series of different military coups and revolts, uh, originally there was a monarchy that was installed as a client kingdom of France and the West. That was overthrown. 
and eventually in the 1960s, Hafez al-Assad, after Nassar of Egypt, uh, had created this uh, unified Arab Republic with Egypt and Syria after he was, you know, done away with or he was no longer a factor. Uh, the Syrians in, in that union were not really happy with the union because largely Egypt was the primary benefactor. And as a result, there were coups in between that. And at the end of all those, Hafez al-Assad, the Shard's father, had ended up coming into power. And he had ruled over Syria for 30, almost 40 years actually. And originally, Hafez, uh, Assad's older brother, uh, Bashar, Bashar's older brother, Basil, was supposed to be the heir apparent, but he died in a car crash in Germany. And originally Bashar al-Assad was supposed to be an ophthalmologist. He was actually studying in London at the time when his older brother had died. And due to the fact that Hafez was aging, he had been quickly hurried back to Syria where he would be groomed in the time that Hafez was still alive to be prepared to be the next heir apparent as he was the next person in line whom was the most fit in that family. Very dynastic and obviously not necessarily what many in the West would see as a democracy. I mean, be that as it may, I think that each part of the world has different cultural and historical developments. And as a result, there's different political structures as a product of that. And at the end of the day, you can't expect, depending on the different histories, that it's gonna be a system that's necessarily representative of everybody in the country. And Syria, the region itself, was historically a very diverse area in terms of the different populations of peoples that had inhabited it. And throughout history, various great powers, including the Achaemenid Persians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Greeks under Alexander, and then later Macedonian, uh, his Macedonian generals who succeeded him, the Diadochi, such as the Seleucid and the Ptolemies, and then later obviously the Romans, and then the Arabs, and then the Ottomans and other people in between, such as the Mamluks and the Crusaders, had all, at different points in history, controlled this particular region. And as a result, the populations, as these different powers had shifted the control over them, had reflected this diverse uh, series of events. And modern day, uh, Syria has tons of different groups, including Sunni Muslims, Shia Muslims, a Christian minority of Greek Orthodox uh, Christians, whom had been uh, descendants of the former uh, you know, Greek rulers uh, and Greek and Roman rulers of Syria. And as a result, this area has always been an area where these different populations have lived alongside each other and different factions at different points had more power and representation than others. But as of the 21st century, when Bashar al-Assad took power, uh, he basically represented a minority faction of Alawites. And despite that, there is at least 60 or 70% before the Syrian crisis of the country, which was Sunni. And obviously they probably didn't enjoy not having as much representation as indicative to their population size. And as a result, the West, unfortunately, and I mean this, don't take my word for it, look into it. The West had been keenly aware of this, and the United States in particular, just like how it was involved with Yugoslavia and the breakup of Yugoslavia, along with other Western countries such as France and the UK, had a vested interest in, you know, getting involved in this region as the United States often does. And just a disclaimer, I am a US resident, a US citizen actually, I grew up here. Um, I actually want to see America succeed, but at the same time, I do not enjoy seeing its foreign policy as it currently exists and how it currently exploits a lot of these different countries abroad for either natural resources or geopolitical power. I believe the U.S. could actually be as great as the propaganda it portrays itself as often being this, you know, force of, self, of, of uh, democracy that encourages other countries to have self-determination. The rhetoric is always there, but I think obviously the actions are never really inclined, or not as always inclined, especially in the Middle East, to reflect the values that we claim to have. And I'd like to see that change, but be that as it may, the West had been involved, and in 2011, as across North Africa and the Middle East broadly, there were these series of uprisings, a part of this broader campaign called the Arab Spring, where populations inside these different countries, whether you're talking about uh, Tunisia, where it first started, Libya, uh, which is definitely another story in itself that I'll talk about another day, and then obviously, you know, uh, Syria and etc. These areas all had revolts where it seemed at least at its offset, people were protesting, demanding for more representation and human rights. 
However, these uh, protests, unfortunately, as they often are, are usually co-opted by foreign powers or external forces that want to use these as opportunities to enhance their own political agendas, for whatever they are. And the United States, along with the UK and France and other powers, especially the Gulf states such as Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, and obviously uh, Israel in particular, they all got involved and had supported the Syrian opposition. And the Syrian opposition in and of itself is a broad umbrella term for these different groups. Originally, some of them were more moderate and secular, such as the so-called Free Syrian Army. But as of 2020 now, there's only a handful of factions that are still left that actually have territorial control. And for the most part, these rebel groups at this point mostly consist of the Al-Qaeda affiliate Hayatir al-Sham, which was previously known as the Al-Nusra Front which is obviously the people who caused 9-11 in America. And just like in the 80s, how the US helped arm the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, and then they had uh, Osama and his buddies turn their weapons on the United States after they defeated the Soviets. In Syria, we, for whatever reason, the United States government, the Pentagon, CIA, had decided to fund Al-Qaeda affiliates. And because, obviously, this is the whole, my enemy, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and they were against Assad. They wanted to create this Islamic uh, emirate in Syria where they would have a Sharia rule of kind, similar to that of which they wanted to install also in Iraq. And then in between, ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, had taken over large swaths of both ISIS, uh, Syria and Iraq, and it tried to create this global caliphate, which was a very short-lived project. And now they've pretty much been, again, reduced to a splinter group of terrorists that commit all sorts of uh, different... Um, isolated incidents now in 2020 up until recently but at one point they were a significant player on the ground and at one point Assad the leader of Syria he had lost almost all the territory save for the vital coastal regions which are also where the main population centers such as Dam uh, not Damascus Homs, Hama, Aleppo and Latakia and obviously the capital of which here he resides Damascus which is the political center of Syria with the exception of those cities, and actually Aleppo and uh, Hama and Homs were all in dispute. The only cities which were never really super duper, the only city that was really never super duper contested was Latakia. Because at one point, I think in 2012, 2013, Damascus itself was actually under siege. And there were points where even where uh, there was, I think, like a terrorist attack where Assad's brother, Maha al-Assad, and his cousin, one of his cousins actually died due to a bombing. And there was a point where there were serious questions to whether or not ISIS would really be able to raise their flag over Damascus. However, the Syrian government under Assad had been able to, with their army, uh, hold out. And enough. they were able to hold out long enough where the Iranians, with their Shia militias, their proxies such as Hezbollah, and then later in 2015, the Russians with their air force had then joined the conflict and had supported Assad. And then in the last few years, gradually, they were able to retake territories. And the decisive start of this was when they were able to finally secure Aleppo, which was formerly the Paris of the Middle East, or the closest thing to New York City in Syria, where this was their number one population center up until the war, and where their uh, uh, economic heartland was, pretty much. After they were able to retake the city, albeit it's now kind of in ruins and needs to be rebuilt to the tune of billions of dollars, uh, the Syrian government, on, with the help of Russia, Iran, and other allies such as China, which were able to provide logistical support and military advisors, they were able to retake uh, most of the other areas, including the hinterlands, including during, I think, 2017, 2018, during the southern campaign, where they were able to take back uh, Daura and the areas that are bordering the contested region of the Golan Heights between the Syrian government in Israel ever since they lost it, I think, in the 60s during the uh, Seven Day War, I believe, or the Yom Kippur War. I know the either or, there have been tons of conflicts in the last decades and a lot of context, obviously. And if I've made any mistakes in between this and you're a Syrian or someone who's been paying more attention than me, I'm no expert, so feel free to correct me below. But this, comp this situation, obviously, as I just described, regardless of the specifics, is very, very complicated. And as of 2020 now, with the help of Russia and Iran, Assad had been able to consolidate control. And at this point, with the exception of the al tamp military base, the U.S. is occupy occupying between the Iraq and Syria border to the southwest of the country, 
uh, and uh, the southeast of the country, and then the northwest, including the region of uh, Idlib, where the uh, Turkish-backed militias, including the remnants of the Free Syrian Army, and primarily it's Hayatir al-Sham that controls those areas. Um, with the exception of those, Assad pretty much controls the remainder of the territory, save for the regions which were historically and currently populated by the Kurdish minority, which had formed the YPG, or the Kurdish Protection Forces, which Turkey claims is an offshoot of the PKK, which is a political party, the Kurdistan Workers' Party in uh, Turkey. As the area, this particular area also is near Iran, Iraq, and also Turkey, and that area contains significant minority population of Kurds that have never had their own political state but want their own right to self determination. And originally, the US had armed and equipped them to fight ISIS. And since Turkey's a member of NATO, and including situations like I need to get into this later, but Michael Flynn from uh, the Trump and Obama administration, it was proven that he was actually taking bribes from the Turkish government and had been encouraging the U.S. to abandon the, their Kurdish allies, and the U.S. obviously, just like with the Bay of Pigs with JFK, had shown it's more of a fair-weather friend, unfortunately. And I say that as an American, whom I personally think the U.S. should have never really been involved in the country to begin with. We should not be meddling in other countries' affairs because when a time comes when we're weak and in a vulnerable position, such as now during this pandemic, when we treat other people like this, we really can't be surprised that when we're down on our luck, the people are going to kick us when we're down ourselves. And we really want to avoid that. And I think that history has said many times, has taught us that what goes around really does come around, as cliche as it sounds. But be that as it may, and I mean, these are all other topics I could talk about that are in and out themselves. Syria is a mess. And right now, um, Assad and Putin, Putin had been joining and he has really been able to, using the Syrian crisis, up uh, Russia's geopolitical uh, uh, power. Ever since the Soviet Union fell in 1991, the Russian Federation, which was basically a rump state after the uh, breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, had really been a shadow of its former self. They have in large part, as of recently, been able to project the appearance of a superpower, when in reality, resource and territorially, they are really just one of many great powers, and in no way the superpower they used to be when they had the full Soviet uh, Union in its uh, highest height. And uh, in particular, Russia's goal in this region was to secure a uh, naval base in Latakia, which it's able to use so it has a gateway to the Mediterranean, which gives it a lot of geopolitical uh, 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 flexibility, I guess, lack of a better term. However, uh, as of recently, there seems to be trouble in paradise, despite many times in the past, uh, to the contrary, it seems that there is a lot of internal uh, disputes between the different factions within Assad's own uh, government, including his cousin, um, Makhlouf, and I think that's his name, Ram Ramali Makhlouf, who is a billionaire uh, oligarch kind of business type man in Syria, one of the richest. He actually has come out publicly, which is actually relatively unprecedented, along with one of uh, Putin's closest uh, one of Putin's closest allies and has been publicly releasing articles across the internet on different publications, uh, criticizing highly Bashar al-Assad. And the reason because of this is due to the fact that Assad, uh, not Assad, Putin, has uh, multiple times tried to, you know, take this victory in Syria that they've been able to earn for Assad, use it to increase their own geopolitical leverage, and then figure out a way to not make this like Afghanistan, where it's a prolonged quagmire, which the Soviet Union ended up having and was one of the leading contributions towards its eventual decline and collapse. And, you know, be able to call it a victory and then, you know, leave and, you know, rest on their laurels. Unfortunately for Putin and Russia, Assad has to seem to be stubborn and hell-bent on reclaiming, and it's understandable, all of the territory that he lost in 2011, including Idlib, including where the Kurds are currently having their autonomous state, and including the Altanth military base, uh, where the U.S. has uh, been located with the pocket of rebels. Assad is not going to be satisfied until he reclaims every inch of territory, as he said in multiple interviews, and I understand that. However, it is obviously very frustrating for Putin and his Russian uh, his Russian, uh, his fellow Russians, that they had came in pretty much 
gave Assad a lifeline and had saved his ass from almost certain collapse along with Iran. And now at this point, since Assad really is only one of Putin's uh, few, I mean, only allies in the Middle East that can provide this crucial military base for Russia. And Assad knows that. So at this point, it seems like the leverage isn't on his side because he has all this territory back that he's already gained. And he has enough of it now where he feels comfortable to defy Putin and continually try to push. And as of very recently, they reclaimed parts of the outlying areas of Idlib province, much to the chagrin of Assad, uh, Putin, whom would much rather him compromise with the remaining rebels and then call it a day and have him be happy with what he has. However, Assad's not going to be satisfied with that. And at this point, Putin seems like all he could do is grin his, grit his teeth and be like, dude, hurry up, because right now it doesn't seem like he's willing to do what Putin wants him to do. And it seems like he's also consolidating power within his own family and apparently is going after other people whom he sees as threats to his consolidation. This all is happening right now in lieu of the pandemic. And obviously Syria, due to the war, is in great need of external help, including billions of dollars of funding to, recover, to rebuild its damaged infrastructure throughout the country. I mean, Damascus is now the number one population center, but Aleppo, which was one of the economic, the key, it was the key strategic economic hub of Syria, has been pretty much left as a wasteland. And there's so many different things, including the different parties such as China and Russia and Iran, whom are going to all vie for their own stake in the aftermath of the Syrian war, as it does seem like it is eventually going to draw to a close. But right now, in lieu of the pandemic and recent events, it seems like all of that is up in the air. And your guess is as good as mine for what direction this is going and going to going to go into next. However, now segueing this back into the West, um, obviously the West has been largely squeezed out in the United States itself, with the exception of the military base it has in the eastern part near the Iraq and Syria border, has largely taken now a tertiary role when it comes to the affairs of the Syrian state. And obviously, Assad has said previously, he has no interest in having any of these countries that had stood against him during the war being involved at any point in the rebuilding process. And that's understandable from his perspective, but it leaves uh, the broader question of where the U.S. should go from now. And I personally think this al Tamf military base is an imperialistic, uh, project that really should not be maintained. It's a waste of money. We have so many problems here in the United States right now. 55% of the country before this crisis could have not afforded an emergency more than $400 in terms of uh, the population. 78% also were living paycheck to paycheck. And now there's millions of more people that had their health insurance tied to their employment, middle class people including included that have been laid off that no longer either have an employment and it's just a source of income or health insurance. There are tons of problems. It seems like the recent stimulus in the United States had been largely going towards bailing out corporations and multinational interests, which is really a shame. The government in the United States really does not represent the people right now, and that's both the Democrats and the Republicans. I'm going to have another video on that soon, but that really is just segueing this now into what's going to happen next. I really want to hear what you guys think. I'm not 100% sure what's going to happen, but I've been keeping up with this conflict in particular, and I think that in the grand scheme of things, that this particular conflict in the, is going to be defined in the history books as one of the most significant in the early 21st century, despite Russia having lost much of its territory, and at this point, really, not since the times of Catherine the Great has Russia been at a territorial ebb as it has been right now, had despite that been able to project uh, geopolitical influence far beyond what it should be able to or what the West expected it to be able to do at least. And it seems like it's now between a rock and a hard place as Putin is aging. He still needs to figure out who's going to fill his shoes. There's a new const uh, shuffling when it came to him uh, changing the entire uh, roles of who's in the government and how the constitution in Russia works. There's a lot of internal problems in Russia as well as they are now being embroiled in their own coronavirus issues. And I think that Assad is going to, with any time soon, probably going to take advantage of the different turmoils happening throughout these different countries that were previously able to focus resources on Syria and try to retake Idlib. But obviously that is something that we really can't ascertain for certain. 
And I really wanna hear what you guys think because this situation I think is going to be way more important when it comes to the broader geopolitical implications, not just for the Middle East, but for the entire world and the great powers as they dispute control over the different areas. As just in the time of the, Ro just like in the time of the Romans and the Persians, this area has always been a contested area. And it's funny because the same areas such as Syria where the United States and Russia slash China have been fighting over were the same areas where the client states of the Lachnids and Ghassanids under the Persians and Romans respectively had also been disputing for centuries as well. And hopefully this conflict, unlike those, does not drag out for centuries. And hopefully the United States develops a more coherent stance on these issues and can somehow figure out a way to move beyond this conflict. Because just like with Vietnam, I feel it's difficult, but it's not 100% impossible for eventually the United States to, if with a change of government and with better priorities and more altruistic motives that aren't just based on self-interest, maybe one day Syria, the Syrian people and the American people can be friends. I've talked to a handful of Syrians, and this is definitely anecdotal, but they love American culture as much, or maybe even more than some Americans do. I mean, I personally have a lot of critiques of American culture that I will definitely be making in future videos, but this is a very sad situation and we don't need to be hostile with this country. Despite what the US government has been doing, their will does not in, is not indicative of my will or most Americans' will. If you ask most Americans, their first question would even be, wait, we're in Syria? Like, most people don't even know that, let alone the fact why we're there. And if, they really, if we all really figured out, like I did or many others have, the inner workings and why we're there and what's really going on, at this point, I think it's time to pack up and bring our troops back and really start to reassess the US's role in the Middle East and start to reallocate resources towards areas where people actually want us, where we can be a positive factor and not a not one of many other negative variables such as in Syria right now, where the remaining rebels are mu pretty much just Al-Qaeda affiliates and Islamists. But that's just my take and I'm curious to hear yours. And let me know what you think, because I've been recording outside, as you can tell, the sun has been coming up and down with the clouds. And I'm curious to hear if you like this setup in contrast to the other ones I've usually had Please let me know what you think. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe, leave a comment, follow me on social media, talk to me. You know, I'm definitely interested in what's going on and I will be keeping up with this event and I will definitely be producing more content on this matter as news and different developments occur. So yeah, my name is Tom. This has been youtube.com slash get nuance. Thanks for watching again and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Hopefully peace across the world, as unlikely as it seems right now can become a closer reality and one day maybe we can all put the past when it comes to these different wars behind us. I wouldn't even be opposed to the U.S. potentially considering its negative contributions, even maybe helping if the Syrians would allow us to rebuild and hopefully forging a friendship between our two peoples because I think long term the only way for the U.S. to continue its global presence and actually not be malignant but actually be a force for good as much as it claims it is that we need to start building consensus and actually have be willing to make concessions and at the same time also as well as protecting the best interest and in putting america first also not being completely ignorant to the needs of other people especially if we're going to be operating in their spheres of influence but yes that's just my take and i'll catch you guys in the next video i make real soon for now stay safe peace out